My name is Mark Safran. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon from Stanford University in California in the United States. Uh, I'm a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon. I do a fair amount of hip arthroscopy and uh, I will be coming, I will be becoming the president of ESHA. Absolutely. Absolutely. California is a great place. I enjoy being at Stanford and ESHA is a wonderful society. Um, one of the former presidents uh, in his presidential speech talked about how it's really a society of friends and, and it really is. It's just really good people in, that are very interested in advancing a very new field which is, makes it really exciting. So it's exciting as we're all kind of uh, venturing through this uh, unknown uh, together. So it makes it great. Very frequently people will say, you know, why are you doing it? It takes too long to do it. It's, it's difficult. But if you look at anything when, there, when there's a new idea, there's always going to be resistance to change. Um, and I just look back at the history of knee arthroscopy and shoulder arthroscopy. I know talking to older surgeons who do knee arthroscopy, they were told doing knee arthroscopy is like tying your pant leg, uh, tying your shoe through your pant leg. And, and in reality, it's the standard at this point, and time has proven it. And I think. Uh, Arthroscopy of the hip makes just as much sense as arthroscopy of the knee, and there are going to be the people who doubt it. But I think that the, the data has been growing in the last five, ten years that show that hip arthroscopy is gaining some momentum, and it is, uh, it is proving to be safer and easier and less morbidity to do with the proper technology and equipment. So there are going to be challenges, and we, we still need to figure out what the limitations are of hip arthroscopy. Um, but again, there will always be those people that are resistant to change no matter what. I enjoy it. Sometimes a little trepidation because I'm trying things uh, in the hip that haven't been tried before and you always want, want to make sure that you're doing the right thing and you don't want to harm the patient and do what's best for the patient. But sometimes you encounter new and different problems and you, you do all the research that you can to try to figure out to make sure that you're doing it, that it will work and that it'll be safe and better for the patient. And, but there's a little bit of trepidation sometimes on those original new cases that you haven't done before. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's exciting. It's, it's exciting when I go do research in the lab because I know we're making a contribution to the field and, and making it better for patients. And, um, and when I do the surgeries, I, I feel like, when I, I always want to feel when my patient leaves the operating room that um, they couldn't have gone somewhere else and gotten it done better and that they will be able to go and do the things that they like to do. Because I say, it, for the types of work that we do in hip arthroscopy, it's not about saving lives. I say it's about saving lifestyles. And so um, if we can get them to be able to do the things they like to do, then, it's, then you've helped them a lot. Yeah, well, I think at this point we've gone for, uh, hip arthroscopy has evolved from what, we, what can we do with the hip scope to uh, what are the potential complications. I think we need to figure out what we, we can really do and help be, make people better, as well as what are the limitations of hip arthroscopy. So I think we're maturing a little bit in that field. From, from my own personal ambitions, it's about trying to make a contribution to the field. And being at a university, um, I have access to research facilities that some people don't have access to. And so I try to do that more from a uh, basic science or scientific uh, uh, perspective um, because that's what I'm it's easier for me to contribute in that way than than some others but I, I think we're all together trying to advance the field um, in a in a proper manner to, to make it better for patients well my father was a travel agent and I remember going t with him at about 11 12 o'clock at night back in the day when the way to communicate with Europe was through telex, teletype, and we went at about 11 p.m. at night to his office and for him to send a telex to Europe. And I remember him telling me, "Don't." A lot of parents want their child to do what they did, and he suggested that I not. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, I, as I was growing up through things, I, I was fascinated. I had a knee injury when I was younger, and I was fascinated by the interplay of muscles, tendons, ligaments, and that did get me very interested in. In orthopedics and, and uh, particularly and tried to keep an open, open mind through college and med school and again I was trained in sports medicine shoulder and and uh, elbow surgery I'd always wanted to whatever I did I wanted to make a contribution I didn't want to just kind of be in another person and and um, hip arthroscopy it just ended up that I was at the right time in the right place to be able to make a contribution in that field and 
I, I enjoy it, making patients better, being at this point still in the earlier phases of hip arthroscopy. I, um, uh, I'm able to contribute uh, from a clinical standpoint as well as being able to contribute from an academic or scientific standpoint. So hopefully I'm still driven by trying to make a contribution and just however I can do that. Well, at my, during my residency, I took a year in the middle of my residency to do a, a research fellowship and it happened that my institution was uh, an institution that did a lot of hip replacement surgery and, and surface replacements. Um, so that got me a little bit more interested in the hip. Um, but, uh, and when I was a fellow um, in the early 1990s, you started hearing some of the reports of hip arthroscopy and so I was kind of intrigued. Um, but in all reality, my, one of my first hip arthroscopy cases was uh, we had a young patient that had, uh, that had, a, uh, had hip pain and had kind of a, what is now kind of an os acetabuli and a torn labrum and I sent him to our hip replacement surgeon because I said it was a hip surgery and they sent him back to me and I said it's an, I can do that through the scope and we sent him back and forth and finally I just did the hip arthroscopy on them and, um, and so I did it by uh, just trying to do the right thing for the patient. And then um, I followed that up very quickly with another kid who had come in with hip pain that we thought was infected and the hip replacement surgeon was on call and he was going to do bilateral open washouts of the hip and I thought that was a very morbid thing to do. So we actually, I scoped the kid's hips, uh, washed out his hips and it ended up actually he had Stills disease. He didn't actually have an infection which makes me very happy that he didn't end up with bilateral 12 inch incisions in a 15 year old's hip. So, um, and that's kind of how things got started and it just kind of kept rolling from there. Practice ahead of time. Uh, you know, as somebody said, getting into the hip is not, um, is not the challenge. It's doing what you need to do and getting out of the hip without people knowing you were there. Um, and so you want to have practice in it. And the hip does require a lot more practice, I think, to get uh, competent at than I think other joints itself. Um, I think working on hips that are not particularly stiff and not uh, uh, particularly over constrained would make it a lot easier. So hips that are a little bit, patients that are a little bit looser hips, just some mild arthritis, that's probably better in case you cause any iatrogenic damage. But uh, um, I would start carefully, plan your time, and plan out the surgery and practice. That I was a good father, a good husband, that I was able to make a good contribution to the field as well as my patients, and uh, that I did it with hard work, high ethical standards, and integrity.